Well, good morning. Today is Monday, August the 28th, and this is microeconomics. For many of you, this is your first time in class. Um, how many of you right now are also are, are from the Wednesday section? Outstanding. I've got about eight or nine people from the Wednesday section. While this course, this class, meets on Mondays, it also meets on Wednesdays, same time, same place. And I have invited everybody from both the Monday class and the Wednesday class, invited and encourage you strongly to attend to come to class Mondays and Wednesdays. I'm going to teach the course as though it meets Monday and Wednesday. That means what I cover on Wednesday will be a continuation of what I was doing Monday. If you don't make it to class, I'm going to video record every class and post them. You'll be able to reach them on Canvas under announcements. They'll go to my YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch and see what happened. If you are in a, an online class, I invite you to come to class if you want to, but I do hold you responsible for everything we cover in the classroom on video. So that'll be testable material whether you're here in the classroom or not. Okay? <clears throat> if you watch the video from last Wednesday and you combine that with examining the syllabus and the course schedule and the various materials about a checklist for what to do in the course, you should be up to speed on what you need to be doing in this course. There is a student information sheet on Canvas. I need you to fill that out and upload it on Canvas to me as an assignment, and from that I will record your attendance. If you have not done that, please do that today. Okay. The most important document for you this term is on the Canvas site under the Admin Documents module. It's called the Course Schedule. It has all of the assignments and the dates for when everything is due. Please take a close look at that. That shows you when the examinations are as well. Examinations are offered on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday. Five days. Take it at your convenience. But take it during those five days. Okay? <clears throat> if you take it on the weekend, you'll take it in the library. If you take it on a weekday, you'll take it at the big open lab. Make sure you know the hours they are open so that you arrive there with two hours to do the exam. In fact, it's an hour and a half exam, but if you don't arrive late. Okay? I have had several questions by email from students who obviously have not read the documents for the course. Don't do that. It makes you look foolish. Read through the materials and then see if you still have questions. If you have any kind of questions administratively about the course content, about life in general, please email me. Please email me. Come in. When you email me, please watch that your email is properly constructed, good syntax, spelling, punctuation. My first name is not A. You don't want to see A anywhere in a damned email, okay? And identify yourself as either a micro student or a macro student or whatever. All right? It is my intent that the classroom is where we will resolve problems. Anything that you've studied, any homework that you've done, any articles you've read, any videos you've watched, if you have questions, you bring them to class and re we resolve your questions or, or issues. I do not want to use the classroom as where I lecture and introduce material to you. It's all on the videos, in the textbook, and in the readings. So we're kind of flipping it. Your homework is to watch the lectures. Your classroom work is to come in and resolve any homework issues you have. Okay? Yes, ma'am. When you take a test at the big open lab, do you have to call and like schedule yourself in? Or you no, ma'am. I, I keep the lab open all five of those days, and you go in at your convenience. No appointment necessary. Okay. Do bring an ID, a picture ID. I allow you a calculator and scratch paper on the examinations. No notes, no textbook. Sir? Does it matter type calculator or? I'm not particular. I would be careful about having something that's got stuff memorized in it. I've had that happen in another course. Anything else?
What was the sign for the first week of class on the course schedule? Student and the student info. Okay. The student info sheet, which you should, <laughs> should submit. But what else was on the course schedule for the first week? Read chapter three. Read chapter three. And were there some readings on Canvas you had to do? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what any one of those was? Your personal brand, the seven mm -hmm. habits of highly effective people, and satisfy some behavior and discretionary effort. Good. They were a number of readings about the way you and or I conduct ourselves and manage our personal, our academic, and our professional lives. What the hell does that have to do with economics? What is economics about? Studying people. It's, do, it's have, doing things based off what you have. That's, that's very close. The textbook will tell you that economics is the study of the allocation of scarce resources. What the hell does that mean? The allocation of scarce resources. What are you going to do with what you have? Yeah, it means how you're going to spend your time, how you're going to spend your money. For you, for a business, for a partnership, for a marriage, or for the country at large. The last one is macroeconomics. This is microeconomics. And it's about how do you make the decisions to do what you're going to do with whatever you've got for you personally or you and your friend or your partner or your business or your spouse. How do you make those decisions? What are you going to do with what you've got? Because what you did with what you had is how you got to where you are today. Did you make good decisions? Did you allocate your resources wisely? Are you pleased with where you've gotten to in life at this point? If life is now a struggle, is that because perhaps you made some bad decisions in the past? So this course is not just about supply and demand and economic theory. This of course is about you personally and what are you going to do with what you've got and what you can get. <clears throat> okay? And so some of that first week reading was aimed at that. One concept was the brand you. You have your own brand and people perceive you that way. If I mention uh, University of Florida, what thoughts, images, or words come to mind? University of Florida. Anybody? Great. Huh? Good grades. Good grades. It's a, an academically demanding higher institution of learning. STEM. What? STEM learning. STEM learning. I know that I can go to the university and get a good education in science, technology, engineering, and math. I'm a business major. What else? Anything else associated in your mind with the term UF? Athletics. Athletic. Strong athletic program. You bet. They have a lot of money. A lot of money, or does it take a lot of money to go there? Both. Both. <laughs> okay. Um, what is what? What thoughts, images, come to mind when I say um, Google? Positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Okay. Words or images that come to mind when I say Google? Information. Information. Anything else? Do you like Google? You like having it? Absolutely. Got all the information of the world right there at your fingertips. If you don't know what to do with the information, it isn't worth a damn. But at least you can get the information, right? Okay. If I were to ask the ten people that know you best, what do you think of your name? What do you think they would tell me if they were being honest? Okay. Just think about that. That's a rhetorical question. That means you don't have to answer it. But if I were to go to all of your instructors from last term and give them your name, what do you think they would tell me about you? Would it be good or bad? Or would it be who? Never. I think I saw the name on the roster. Not very memorable. Okay. My point is that your brand is how the rest of the world is going to evaluate you for the rest of your life. And you are managing that brand right now. The way you dress, the way you speak, the way you are prepared or not, whether you are punctual to class, whether you turn in your work on time, 
I'm evaluating you that way non-stop. Every time I get an email from you, if I get an email from you that says, hey, in the first place, I'm probably going to send it back. But in the second place, I'm going to remember that, oh, yeah, he was one of those. Didn't pay attention. When I get an email from you that says, what material does the first exam cover? I know you haven't read the damn course materials yet. Okay? Everything you do, everything you say, you're being evaluated on, and images are being created that people store, and that's who they decide you are. And if you think it's going on at school, wait till you go to work. How many of you ever, have ever walked into a classroom in school, public school, and you were new, and so you were the new guy or new girl coming in front of the room? You ever had that happen? Just a couple? What's that like? It is not fun. Hi, this is Roger. He's new with us. Everybody say hello to Roger. And you're thinking, there, oh, my God. And what is the rest of the class doing? They're looking at you, and they're whispering to each other, and they're laughing. You know they're laughing at you, and you feel like a jerk. Okay? They're judging you based on the first 30 seconds they saw you. When I walked into the classroom today, how many of you are, are seeing me for the first time today? Just a few. Just a few. Well, you were making decisions right there based on the way I dressed, the way I comported myself, the things I said, the things I did. You were making decisions right there, consciously or non subconsciously, on whether you trust me. And trust is the most important element of your brand, that I can trust you. But whether I'm competent at what I'm doing, whether this course is going to be a bitch or a real cruise, no problem, okay? You were making decisions. The brand you is about you and your brand and how you manage it. And you best start managing it right now. Because if you're not managing it, the rest of the world is. And I will be sending you more material on that line of thought as the course goes by. Uh, allied with that was an article on satisficing behavior. Anybody read that? I see one hand. To satisfy. Anybody else? Satisficing behavior. Two. So that's been out there and assigned for last week, right? And here we are the second week and you haven't read it. That means you're behind schedule. Now I'm going to keep throwing stuff at you all term long that if you don't stay up, you're going to get behind. And you will not succeed. Because that's the way the world works. Satisficing behavior. That's when you do just enough to get by. Just enough to satisfy, but nothing extra, right? That's when you walk into the course and you say, hmm, I need a 70 to make a C. Good, that's what I'm going to aim at. There's an economics term to describe that. The word is stupid. <laughs> If you aim at a C, that's the best you'll do, and the chances are you'll make a D or an F. Okay? When you do just enough to get by, you're going to find yourself doing that for the rest of your life. And when I have a group of you like this, and I need to promote one of you to the next job, do I want to promote the satisficer? No. If I'm interviewing you for a job, and I sense from your transcripts, your interview, whatever else, your appearance, that you are just kind of a I'll do enough to get by kind of person. Do I want to pay money for you? No. And if you are a satisficer, you will find doors to your future closing on a regular basis. The antithesis of that is what I call discretionary behavior or discretionary effort. That's the effort you do that is beyond what is absolutely necessary and takes you to a level of if not pretty damn good, maybe even excellence, okay? I'm looking for people who exert a discretionary effort in their academic life and hopefully in their personal and professional lives, who do more than is necessary in order to succeed. It is the people who exercise discretionary effort who be, go beyond the minimums that find doors open into their future. That's in one of the readings I asked you to do for today, for last week, okay? Get that stuff read. This week, I think you had a series of videos to watch, right? Anybody watched any of the videos for this week? I see two hands. Two hands. So let me warn you. I'm not trying to be a jerk about this, but let me warn you. In this course, for the last five years that I've been teaching it, 
40% of the course drop, drops. 40% of my students drop this course. Another 10% fail. And they do so because they did not do the work in a timely manner. There is too much for you to sandbag and wait till the last minute to get it all done. So if you are procrastinating and not staying up in this course, if you lack self-discipline, if you lack organization, 50% of you will not complete this course successfully. How much does this course cost? Say again. $320. It's about $320 for tuition. It's $107 for the Connect series at the cheapest rate. You got $425 in this course plus any time you spend on it. And if you don't complete it and pass it, you just poured all of that down the drain. That's called dumb, right? So put the time in and get done. Of the 50% of the students who do finish this course, the predominance of them make A's and B's. There's a few C's. Because the material for this course is not difficult. It does take time to learn. But it is not something that you cannot learn. Okay? So there becomes a very clear divide. Anybody here familiar with the term bell curve? Yeah. What's a bell curve? A curve that looks like a bell. A curve looks like You're not allowed to define something with the same terms. It's, it's a distribution. It shows you the distribution, usually in this case, of grades. And they say that in a bell curve course, these are A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. That typically, let me do that the other way. A's, B's, C's, D's, F's. So that typically there'll be a few A's and a few F's, some more B's and some more D's, and most people will make a C. That's a bell curve distribution, okay? And so it looks somewhat like a bell. If I decided to tell you that we're going to set the grades for this class on a bell curve, what would that mean for you? I can't hear you. You're going to have to speak more clearly. The majority of people are going to get C's. The majority of people are going to get C's. OK, does that put you in competition with each other? It means for everyone who makes an A, I'm going to get somebody an F. What if all the grades in the class at the end of the course, all the grades were ranged from 90 to 100. You all had an average of 90 to 100. If you had a 91 average, what do you get in the class? An F. You're at the bottom of the distribution. What would it take to get an A? You'd have to have an average of about 99. Would that be fair? No. Why not? Because you still need an A. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I don't think that would be fair at all. But. It would make life a little more competitive for you, wouldn't it? Sure. I want to show you what my grades look like based on the people who first enroll in the course. The end of the term. Looks like this. This is called a bimodal distribution. I have two most common grades, F's and B's. Okay? Very few people in this class make a C. That's because if you put the work in, you make a B. And if you don't put the work in, you don't pass the course. OK? Guess what? The rest of the world is very much like this, particularly the work world. You go to work in my company, you typically become a producer, or you become a parasite. You are basically in my business to get a paycheck, and you don't care about contributing. You exercise satisfying behavior, et cetera. <coughs> If this is what the world is like, what does that mean for you? Well, you'll always be in competition, but if you're really working at it, guess what? All of these people are no longer your competition. You'll be in competition with a relatively few people. And so if you can compete, you will succeed. But if you won't do anything, there is no future for you. Was high school like that? Um, no. No? How, how do you mean explain? It was easier. The easier. Everybody passed. No. Pretty much? No? The majority. The majority passed? But I mean, if you were dumb, pass. Say again? 
Me? Yeah. I mean, if you were dumb, you didn't pass. If you were dumb, you didn't pass. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's more like dedication like, and all you had to do is really show up. Let me ask. Let me ask you this way. Let me ask you this way. If you wanted to get through high school with a C average or better. On a scale of 0 to 10, 10 means you bust your ass, and 0 means you don't do nothing. How hard did you have to work to get a C or B? 0 to 2. Say again? I probably still going to do a 0. My, the average answer for my classes, I've been asking that question for 25 years. The average answer has gone from 5 to 4 to 3. That the effort required in high school to get just a C average is basically show up and breathe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Schools do get paid based on how many people uh, graduation rates as well. They get pressure to graduate people. You're right, and that that's, makes them let people get through who really shouldn't. I've been. This is the beginning of my 38th year of teaching at Santa Fe. I told you what my failure rate is like. I have never ever had anything said to me by anybody on this campus about failing so many students because they know what my standards are and they know what my good students do. So there's no pressure to pass people out here. you got to do the work. Yes, ma'am? The Learn Smart that's due Friday? Yep. Is that on Connect? All of the Learn Smarts are on Connect. I got a question about that. With the Learn Smart, can you like stop in the middle and then continue back where you started on? I don't know. I think so, but yeah, I don't care. Yeah, you can save an exit. Go ahead. I don't know. I answered the question myself. <laughs> you have a lot of conversations for yourself, Ellen? <laughs> yeah. 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 Could you briefly go over the part of the textbook that was on market outcomes? It was like what, how, and whom. I found the We say in, in economics, we say there are three basic questions that we have to answer in economics. You know, the question was, what are you going to do with what you, what you got? Well, yeah, the first thing we got to say is, what are we going to do? What are we going to produce? This is textbook now. As a nation in the United States, do we want to make a lot of schools and hospitals and roads? Or do we want to make a bunch of military aircraft, aircraft carriers, tanks and stuff? What are you going to produce? If you have a business, the question is, what are you going to produce? You're going to produce computers, you're going to produce cell phones, whatever. Then, how are you going to do it? That is, what's the best way to go about doing this? And we want you to be efficient. Efficient means high quality, low cost. And that's what being in a business is all about. How do you produce the best possible product or service at the lowest possible cost? But then in the economic sense, we say as a nation, once we decide what we're going to produce and who's going to do it and what way are they going to do it in, that sort of thing, then we say, the question usually is given, for whom? I wasn't good with crayons either. For whom are you going to produce it, or who gets it? How do we share it? Those are the fundamental questions. And you know, there'll be a couple of questions on an exam about that, but they're pretty basic. To, to add a little bit to this, this is called the allocation question. How are you going to allocate your resources? That is, what are you going to use them to produce? This is called the production question. What method of production are you going to use that's going to be efficient? The production question. The third one is the big one that is so controversial. Who gets it? Which we call the distribution question. And that's when you get into matters of equity. What does equity mean? And in a financial terms, it's your ownership share of, of whatever asset. But in the general social science sense, equity. Uh, fairness. fairness. What's the fair way to do Do you think we should raise the minimum wage to $15? No. no. 
depends on you ask. I'm asking you. I mean, no. I, I want more. <laughs> you do want more money, well, there'll be less jobs. You and me. Yeah. Huh? There'll, there'll be, be less jobs. jobs. Wouldn't the cost of living just skyrocket? Yeah. Yep. Is it fair to people to be working for eight dollars an hour when you can't afford to feed your family on that? You're still not going to be able to after, like the cost of living goes up because if the cost of living goes up yeah. a whole lot, your fifteen dollars won't buy you anymore. Exactly. Well, let me ask you this: Is it fair that Walmart pays their people so little money that the average Walmart employee is on welfare, different forms of welfare? And in fact, they tell their employees, go to the HR office and see if you're eligible for food stamps. Well, who's paying that Walmart employee? Walmart or me and you, the taxpayer? The taxpayer. Oh, yeah. We are subsidizing Walmart to some degree. Is that, see, this is the question of fairness. Is that fair? What's the best way to achieve that? With respect to the minimum wage, we're going to talk some more about that. And we're going to see that it is not yes or no that most of the things we talk about when I ask you a question, it's not yes or no, it's going to be, well, it's somewhere in the middle. If I say, should we raise the minimum wage, I'm asking you for a normative answer. A normative answer is an opinion. An opinion. Here we go again. Go ahead. What if I asked you this? If we raise the minimum wage to $15, will some people lose their job? Yes. yes. I think that's absolutely certain. I think that's a fact. Some people just aren't worth $15. So that becomes a positive question because it's talking about fact. If we raise the minimum wage, will some people lose their job? Yeah. Is it a good idea to raise the minimum wage? Oh, that's a normative question. Okay. And we're, we want to look at both sides of that, the minimum wage. What are the advantages to raising the minimum wage? People who work at minimum wage can afford to buy more stuff. Okay? That one person on a minimum wage could perhaps support their family. Okay? What's the other good parts of raising the minimum wage? Anybody know? Because we've tried it in some parts of the country. Guess what happened? Go ahead. I mean, if you give somebody more money, they're going to spend more so they might... Great. If lots of people who now make eight bucks an hour are making fifteen bucks an hour, there's they're going to be spending that in your community, and you're going to have more business. You're going to have more customers spending more money. That's a very positive attribute, depending on what you're selling. Any other positive aspects to raising the minimum wage? We find that when we pay people more money and we raise that minimum wage, they become more productive. They actually work harder, they're more dependable, they show up on time, they, they, the quality of their work goes up. We have less turnover, people quit, stuff like that. So there are some positive aspects to raising the minimum wage. What are the negative aspects? I'm going to raise prices as part of my business to cover those costs. Fewer jobs. There's going to be some people that lose their jobs. Because they're just going to be replaced by computers. As we raise your wages, it becomes much more attractive to me to try to replace you with a robot, a computer, artificial intelligence, or something. Taxes. If we raise wages, we will collect more taxes. If you're in the government, that's a good thing. Wouldn't we have to make a whole new like, tax bracket because no one would even be in the... Uh, 10% margin anymore. They might, they might have to. You're right. They might have to take the minimum tax bracket and have that go from 30000 up or something. You know? Wouldn't inflation play into it eventually, too, because the market will correct itself in 10 years? $15 really be like $8 all To the extent that my higher wages that i got to pay my employees cause me to raise prices, there's your inflation. <clears throat> but I want you to think of something. Think about something with me just, just for a minute here to illustrate that. Suppose I have a business that my costs are $100,000 a year. And of that, $50,000 of that is to my minimum wage employee. Okay? If I double their income, 
I jump them from eight to sixteen dollars an hour. What will happen? My cost will go from fifty to what? A hundred thousand. So now my total cost is a hundred thousand. I'm sorry, hundred and fifty thousand. Everybody okay with that? So now think about this. I doubled their wage, right? But what happened to my costs? It only went up by 50%. They got a 100% increase in pay. I had a 50% increase in cost. Do I need to double my prices to cover to double their wage? No. No. Do I need to double my prices to pay for this wage increase? If I double my prices, their money wouldn't do them any good. They couldn't buy any more. But I don't need to double my prices. My point is that when you raise wages, you don't have to raise prices by that much to cover your costs. So the idea that it's going to cause much higher prices theoretically is not true, and in practice where we've seen it applied is also not true. That's economic analysis. That's not just, well, if you've got to raise wages, you've got to raise prices. If you double those, you're going to have to double those. No, Moose Breath. Think about it. If your workers are only 10% of your business, the ones who get a wage increase, if that's only 10% of your business, your costs are only going up by 10%. You don't need to double your prices. So th there's a little more depth to these arguments that we want to kind of investigate and discuss in the class. All right. Other, other comments, other questions? Say again. Where are all the videos? You go to Canvas, you go to the Administrative Documents module, and you locate the course schedule. That's the most important document in this course. The course schedule. It shows you the date of every exam and what material is on it, and week by week it shows you the videos or the readings or the PowerPoints, whatever there is, for each week. You should have those readings, videos, etc. done before you come to class on Monday of each week. Okay? Yes, sir? Um, in the circular flow model, yep. there's product markets and there's factor markets. I guess my confusion lies in, like, can't factors of production also be products? No. And this is economic terminology. That's all. Okay. When we talk about factors, <clears throat> we're talking about what businesses buy. What do they buy? They buy labor. Capital. They buy capital goods like trucks or assembly lines or computers. Land. They buy land. And depending on what you want to, depending on the model you're playing with, labor is going to be the, the big one that you talk about. Factor markets are inputs, what businesses buy. Product markets are outputs. That's the stuff you and I buy. Okay. <coughs> Computers, pool cues, automobiles, beer, that kind of stuff. Okay? Good question. <clears throat> you kind of took me back to where I want to go. Again, I want you to use the classroom to come in and ask questions about any of the stuff that you've been assigned. Anything you've read, any video you've watched, any learn smart assignment you've done. Okay? Let me give you a little, little cue here <clears throat> that I got from my best students. If you go into uh, Windows, there is something called a snipping tool. Go to Microsoft Windows Accessories. Anybody, how many of you are familiar with a snipping tool? A few. Find that in Accessories, right click on it, put it into your toolbar where you can get to it. And as you go through Learn Smart or those practice quizzes, and a question comes up and you look at that and you wonder, what the hell is that? And you look at it and you research it and you read it and you can't figure it out, snip it. It just captures your screen. 
save it into a file and bring those to class and say, look, I found this in, in the you know, question, one of the questions on a practice quiz was about such and such, and I couldn't figure it out. What does it mean? Great. Now we'll work on it. I've had students tell me that they go through and they snip every single question. They copy it and they put it in a file and that's their study book for getting ready for exams. Well, that's a good, good approach. Okay? Use that. Capture that stuff. Bring it to class. Let's resolve the questions in the classroom. Other questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am? Yeah, the only thing that will, you will submit, and it will submit automatically, are the Learn Smarts, and they have a very specific deadline. And if you miss that deadline, send Lloyd. I'm sorry about that. It closes and I can't open it. Does that mean it'll affect your grade? What effect do Learn Smarts have on your grade? Anybody? It's a close grade, you'll round up if you feel like there's a good effort on the Learn Smarts. Perfect. If you have a borderline grade at the end of the term, I'm going to go back and look at your Connect record. If you've done the Learn Smarts and you've done all the practice quizzes and you've really been working at it, you're going to get the upper side of that grade. If I look at your, your Connect records and you haven't done much of anything and you waited till the last minute to do everything, then you're not going to be, get the benefit of that borderline grade. So if you have good, solid A's on every test, I don't care if you never did a Learn Smart, you get your A. But if you're borderline, You'll get the B, not the A. Okay? Good. Other questions? This is the second week of class. At this point, you should have worked through Chapter 3. You should have looked at the PowerPoints 1 through 4 on supply and demand. There are a number of other PowerPoints that help explain supply and demand. And you should have gone by now into Canvas and into the materials for exam one or title approximately that. And you should have started on Appendix A. There are appendixes A through E. These are multiple choice questions about supply and demand. They're similar to the practice quizzes from, from Connect, but they're much more difficult. These are the questions I made up. They all have answers. You should be working through that daily, getting ready for the first exam. Appendix A has 75 multiple choice questions, and they're not easy ones. But when you get into those and you start thinking through them, you'll know if you know the material or not, and you will have questions when you come to class. If you save these appendices to do the three or four days before the exam, you will not pass the exam. This is the best examination preparation you can get. If you work on this and then you go back through some of the textbook practice quizzes, they'll seem kind of, oh yeah, I got that. This is the key to exam one. What I need you to do is get started into Appendix A and by Wednesday when you come to class, come in and say, hey, I'm on Appendix A number 17 and were you drunk when you wrote this? And we'll talk about it. Hell, I might have been, you know. <laughs> How do you think I make up these questions? I sit down at my desk, I fix a picture of martinis, and I make up questions, you know. If you get into, especially Appendix A and then Appendix B, they're the, they're the real mothers, okay? But you get weighted down into those hip deep and working on those questions and calling up a classmate or working with a study group and working and working, you're going to know in a hurry, damn, I don't understand that. And that's what you bring to play, okay? I would like to start every class with the same question. What's that question? Same question every day. What do you want to talk about? I'd like to open the day up a little casually and informally and relax and say, what's on your mind? What's going on? I welcome your, your questions or, or comments about anything. 
from parking at Santa Fe to I need to get a new tire for my car. Is there a good place in town to go? Um, you know, where are, the, where are the Wednesday night specials in Gainesville? I don't care. Let's just chat. I would also ask you, before you come to class each day, take a look at the news. Go to Google. Look at Google News for 15 minutes. See what's going on in the world and come to class. Let's talk about some of that. What do you think about Elon Musk? What do I think about Elon Musk? Uh, I'm reserving my opinion so far. I like a lot of what I see about him. But what do you think about him? I think he's really innovative. Like he's he's an innovator. He's gonna he's gonna change the world. He's the next the next big thing. I really think so. I think you're right. I think you're right. Does, do you know where the Apple Store here is, is in, in town, Gainesville? Is anybody know where the Apple Store is? I didn't know the words. <laughs> no, thank you. You were being very honest. Apparently, nobody else does either. You ever heard of a place called Gator Tech? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gator Tech is down on Archer Road, Butler Plaza. That's the Apple store. The fellow that owns that is a former student and a very, very close friend of mine. He's a real tech guy. He talks to me about Elon Musk frequently. And he thinks he walks on water, or at least as I do as do. So, yeah, I love to chat about that kind of stuff, what's going on. Um, necessarily, occasionally, when we look around at the news, we're going to touch on politics. And we'll talk about some of that, good, bad, and indifferent. That's okay. How can you chart a, a course for your future if you don't know what's going on around you? So part of our introductory conversation every day can be about, I read this in the news, what do you think? Or I think this, or... Uh, this guy's a jerk. Oh, yeah, all right, okay. All right? And every time you get something from the news, what's the first thing you need to do? Gotcha. See where it came from. Who was the source of that news article? If it was Fox News, it's going to be very, very conservative. If you got it off of MSNBC, it's going to be very liberal. But in between is a lot of other stuff. So if you got an article that came from Atlantic Magazine, would you expect it to be pretty liberal or pretty conservative? Hell, go look up Atlantic Magazine online, read the Wikipedia, and see whether it's basically conservative or liberal. You ever heard of the American Enterprise Institute, AEI? Probably not. Very conservative. And if you read their stuff and you thought that was the gospel truth, you'd have a very different view of someone who pays more attention to something like the New York Times. So bring some stuff in the news to me to class, but remember to tell me where to come from and what kind of outfit is that. And let's talk about that as we go along. Let's get informed about what's going on around us. Anybody here ever screwed up before? If I figure that your average age is about 20, 21, my age is three times that little. I've screwed up at least three times more than you have, and probably on a much, much larger scale. So what do you do when you screw up? You fix it and you learn. You get back up on the damn bicycle and you keep riding. Now, along the way this term, everybody in this class is going to have some sort of minor obstacle or upset at least. Some of you are going to run into some real issues or problems. When that happens, if you need to chat about it, you shoot me an email. We'll go somewhere and we'll have a beer or a cup of coffee and we'll talk about it. If you've got a friend who's got some difficulty and you just need an outside opinion on what should he do, shoot me an email. We'll talk about it. I will be very confidential with anything we talk about. But my sense is over the last few years that college has become much more challenging than it used to be. Not academically. Academically, college is not as difficult as it used to be. They tell us today that if you had a 2.5 average back in the 1960s, that's the same as about a 3.5 average today. There's been a lot of grade inflation. Okay? And I think to some degree that's true. But I'll tell you something else. My generation didn't have to go through the kind of hassles you do dealing with technology, dealing with roommates, dealing with... How many of you here work part-time or full-time? Look around the class. That's a hell of a lot of students. We didn't have that many people who worked 
when I went to school. You guys are dealing with a lot more struggles. Many of you in my classes are not 18 or 20 years old. You're 25 and 30 years old. You've got a family. You've got kids. You've got two jobs. And it's stressful. I know it is. You get into some issues. If I can help, I will. Let me know. Okay? Because it's a hassle. What's on your mind? Um, I was watching uh, Shark Tank the other day. Well, okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, uh, I, I don't know, can you, I guess, go over like valuations and how they're formed? I mean, I, I think it's all edited down, but. The simple rule of thumb <clears throat> is you come to me with a business proposal, and you better have a detailed proposal, and you say, I'm going to make this product that sells for this price, $12. I figure it's going to cost me $6 a piece. So I'm going to make $6 per unit. And that's got to pay for my rent and utilities and all my other, what we call, overhead. Okay? And I think that I can sell 42,000 units the first year. i got to figure from that, how much money did you make? Suppose you said, well, I figured out my utilities and that's going to cost me uh, $22,000 a year. What does that tell me? You make at least that. That means you've got to cover $22,000 by making $6 profit per unit. So you divide that out, that goes 332. That means you've got to sell 3,200 units this year. To sell 3,200 units this year means you've got to sell give or take per month. You've got to sell 300 a month. That's just to break even. Ain't no profit. I plug in the profit, buy is profit, and then I say, well, gee, for your business to be successful, you've got to sell 571 units every month. Is that reasonable? And you've got to prove to me that, yes, I can sell that many units with these costs and these prices. When you start doing that, I'm starting to put a subjective value on your business. That's kind of where it all started. There's a couple of things here. You estimated your cost here. You estimated your cost here. If I'm working with people who are building a business plan, my advice is you double those numbers because you're kidding yourself. You're lying to yourself. So double your costs. And when you tell me I can sell 300 a month, I tell you to cut that by one half. Cut your revenue estimate in half. If you still got a viable idea, let's talk about business. But you've got to prove really strong, you've got to prove to me there's that much sales out there. That means you've got to know the market. You've got to know the trends. You've got to target your market. Who are you going to sell it to? How old are they? How much money do they make? Where do they live? What do they watch? Okay. How many of you are familiar with a, a website called Meetup? Meet up. Anybody? Okay, just curious. I'll tell you more about it later. How many of you are on Facebook? Not all that many. Interesting. Where would you say you get most of your information about what's going on? Reddit. Say again? Reddit. Reddit? Where else? Twitter. Huh? Twitter. Twitter? How many Twitter? Worse. Okay. Worse. If you were trying to figure out where to go tonight for supper or a movie to go to, what would you do? Yelp. Tap it in on Google. <laughs> Google, Google or Yelp? Okay. I'm just curious. I tell my friend Jim that owns the Apple store, I tell him every term, I say, I go into my classes and I ask him, where's the Apple store? And nobody knows. Because it's not really an Apple store. Actually, it is. Right, you sell new <laughs> Apple equipment. But it's and not like... Okay. It's not your big set. Yeah, yeah. But have you been in there? No, no, no. Been, I'm sure you just sell, but I, what I'm saying no, is... Walk in. It's like a miniature Apple store in the, in the sense it's clean, it's neat, it's open, the stuff's out there where you can play with it. So but I set up the same. Apple has different kinds of retailers. Yeah. But if you need your Apple equipment re repaired, where would you go? What would you do? <laughs> this man made an A for the day. <laughs> I just, 
I just wonder where you get your information to lead your life. And I'd appreciate any, any you know, constructive input you might have in that regard. How long does that Gator Tech business? Oh, I don't know. Five years? Four or five years? Maybe more? I don't know. At my, think about this. If you're 20 years old, one year is one twentieth of your life, right? That's five percent. So for you, one year, that's five percent of my life. If you're 60 years old, guess what? One year is less than one percent of your life. So when you say how many years ago? A few. A few to me means between two and 25. <laughs> that's what happens when you get old. <laughs> All right. I've asked you to get into supply and demand, and when you do, this is just a broad overview, you're going to learn what a demand curve is, which is the relationship between price and quantity and how much people buy. Demand is buyers. The demand curve says that if, and this axis here, the vertical axis, is the if axis. It starts there. If the price is $6, then, down here, then, we read to the graph, the line, and down, then people buy 71 units per week. So we call this the independent variable because it changes by itself. And we call this the dependent variable. And that's how you read graphs. You say, what's up here? Price. What's down here? Quantity. Oh. Then the quantity depends on the price. Yes, it's a de dependent variable. And if the price falls to $3, what happens? Then people buy 149 units. I'm making up the numbers, obviously. Okay? That's how we read a demand curve. That first PowerPoint out of the PowerPoints 1 through 4 kind of marches you through this. Very clear. And as soon as you think, you look at this and you think, well, this is pretty damn simple, then we screw with you. Then we make it difficult because we say, but sometimes the demand curve's out here. Not demand curve number one, demand curve number two. And you go, what? And that's um, like after Ceteris Paribus is broken or like that, that, that rule is broken, that's when the demand curve turns into that one. Not necessarily the rule is broken. The world changes. What would make the demand curve at number one move out to demand curve number two? Better yet, what's going on at demand curve number two? When the price is $6, I don't sell 71. I read out here and say, oh my god, I sell 158 of them. People are buying more. And if I had the price at $3 and still selling 145 holy hand, look at that. People are buying 234 of them. What happened? People are buying more. That's an increase in demand. Increase always means it moved to the right. That could be like an international if you open up free trade. Good. What made the demand curve move? And this is the big deal. This makes or breaks you great on this, on this first edge. There are five things that shift the demand curve. One, two, three, four, five. I'm not going to drag you through them right now. They're right there on the videos and the, and the stuff. But this is the list that starts with um, number of buyers. What do you suppose happens to the demand for beer in Gainesville on a football weekend? It doesn't go up or down. We don't move curves up or down. It goes right or, what's another way to say that? Demand increases. It, demand increases. Good. Okay? Demand increases because there's more buyers. What happens on Monday morning or Sunday night? The demand decreases. It moves back. Okay? So the number of buyers is important. Um, the buyer's expectations. If the buyers expect Florida to win the game this weekend, do they buy more beer? Yeah, they do before the game. What about after the game? Yes. So, yep, they still buy more beer, right? If they, if they get their butts kicked, what happens? 
Then you have me. I got a hard liquor, man. <laughs> Your expectations. Um, tastes and preferences. Does beer taste better when Florida plays Florida State? Yes. Oh, tell yes. Okay. All right. Tastes and preferences. Um, if Florida is at the top of the SEC and getting ready to go to the national championship, do people buy more Gator hats and T-shirts? Yes. Oh, hell yes. Taste and preferences. Okay. If the Gators go out and lose the first six games, what's going to happen? I don't want to wear no damn Gator. <laughs> I think I'll buy me a Braves hat. That's baseball. Okay. Incomes. If people are getting pay raises and earning more money, do they buy more stuff? Yes, sir. Almost always, but not always. If I gave you, if I doubled your income tomorrow and you went shopping at Publix, is there anything in Publix that you would buy less of? Generic goods? You buy the brand names instead? Okay, that's good. Anything else? You're a starving student. You're barely getting by. What do you fix for supper? Ramen noodles with a bottle of ketchup. Right? <laughs> but now you've doubled your income. You going to buy more ramen noodles? You're going to buy a steak this time. You damn skippy, I'm going to buy a steak. <laughs> right? So there's two kinds of things here. There's normal goods, and almost everything is normal. That means when I get more money, I buy more of it. Okay, but then there's things called inferior goods. Not because the quality is bad, we just call them inferior because of the way people buy. What's going to happen to the sale of cheap beer if everybody starts making more money? They're going to buy less of it. Okay? So you've got to know that. And then the other one here is the price of related goods. I want you to think real carefully with me here. There's two possibilities. If the price, listen carefully, if the price of Chevrolet trucks goes up, what's going to happen to the demand for Ford trucks? Uh -oh. Right. Huh? Uh -oh. Chevrolet prices go up, demand demand for Fords goes up? Mm -hmm. You sure? Why would it go down? Go down right? Why would it go down? If Chevrolets get more expensive, are people going to buy more Fords? Yes. Oh, hell yes! See, I can just change the tone of my voice and make you doubt yourself. You don't want to be there for an example. If the price of Fords goes up, then the demand for Chevrolets is going to increase. Because kind of people are going to look around and say, I'm paying that much for a damn Ford. I'd rather have a shape. They're not as expensive. What do we call that? Competition. Competition. These goods we call substitutes because they're in competition with each other, okay? But there's another kind of good out there, not just substitutes. Name, name some other substitutes for me. Give me two substitutes. Uh, Crafting and Hunts. Craft and what? Velveeta. Craft and Velveeta cheese. Damn, I hadn't bought a thing of Velveeta cheese in years. That brought back memories. <laughs> I remember being a student. Yes, sir? It said Heinz and Hunts for ketchup. Heinz and Hunts ketchup, okay. Why wouldn't you buy Publix? <laughs> you got too damn much money. This is generic good. Most goods are, are uh, generic goods are inferior goods. Okay. What are y'all laughing about? You laughing at me? Do I look funny? No, 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 no. You damn skippy out there. What are you laughing at? Huh? What y'all laughing at? Uh, he said a joke. No, 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 I didn't say. It. You didn't say nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about something where you, when you buy this, you need this to go with it? Give me an example. Huh? PB and J. Peanut butter and jelly. Nah, peanut butter and bread. <laughs> peanut butter and bread. You don't like jelly? What are you, a communist? <laughs> That's two more dollars, you know, you can just say it. You're right, peanut butter and bread. But, you know, hell, I, I can have peanut butter and jelly on a cracker. Uh, That's because I'm a communist. <laughs> <laughs> peanut butter and jelly, typically, not for everybody, typically when you buy peanut butter, you like to have some jelly with it, right? And there'll always be somebody in class who say, I don't like peanut butter. Well, I don't give a damn what you don't like. <laughs> this is about the market. It's not about you this time, okay? <laughs> give me something else where you, when you buy this, you've got to have this to go with it. A car and gasoline. Car and gasoline. Good one. A flashlight and batteries, all right? 
Huh? Cookies and milk. Cookies and milk. Absolutely essential. Okay? What do we call it when if you buy this one, you need this one to go with it? What do we call those kind of goods? Compliments. Call them complements. So for complements, when the price of peanut butter goes up, what happens to the demand for jelly? If peanut butter starts costing $22 a jar, what happens to the demand for jelly? Goes down. No. So the price of peanut butter goes way up. What happens to the demand for jelly? It goes down. Yeah. It goes down. Peanut butter so damned expensive I can't buy it. I don't need no damn jelly. <laughs> Make sense? So the arrows move in opposite directions. Look what we just did with that last one. For substitutes, the arrows move together. For complements, the arrows move opposite. These are the rules you've got to learn for exam one. And there's a whole different set of rules for the supply curve, five of them. That's what you've got to get buried into and learn. And the sooner you do it, the better, because it, it takes repetition. Again and again and again, doing problem after problem. And if you're smart, you're going to have at least two or three people that you can call on the phone or text with or email that you can work together and work on this, okay? You gotta have somebody you can call up and say, damn Jim, have you done number 14? What the hell is he talking about? <laughs> and you gotta be able to talk it out. Okay? And then when you've worked on it with a couple of other people and you still can't figure it out, even though the answer's there, you still can't figure out how he got that, then you bring it to class and we figure it out. Okay? That's how this works. Your grade from this moment on guarantee is absolutely a function of how much time you spend in this course. If you can finish Appendix A by next Monday, you're pretty much on track. You ought to be through Appendix B by then. That's a lot of stuff. Okay? And each but, appendix is the same five questions, right? Say it. Are each appendix is like same five questions or does it vary? No, the other appendices are not as long, they're shorter. But Appendix A is, is where you first see it, and if you, if you work on Appendix A and get it right, you'll, you'll learn it. Then the others are going to just be practice. The exams are cumulative or just like sections? I'm sorry. Are the exams cumulative? Or no, the exams are standalone. Yeah. So you only get one chance at supply and demand, and you get it or you don't. And that's 25% of your grade. You got four tests, and that's your grade. Okay? And the bottom line is, you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. Nobody else is in charge of that. If you have a problem, you let me know. An academic problem, can't figure this out. An other problem, academic, personal, professional, anything you want to talk about, I'll chat with you. Like I said, I screwed up a whole lot more stuff than you have, and I know some of the wrong things to do really good. And I can tell you about them. But I can also tell you how to avoid doing the wrong stuff or how to fix it. You probably can't tell me anything you're going to do or have done that I haven't had some experience with, firsthand or secondhand. Okay? Don't you let this damn thing take advantage of you. You get up and you whip its ass now. All right? I'll see you next week. Bye.